All right, uh, it's 5.30, I think we'll get started. Okay, uh, I'm Jeff Spees. I'm the Chief Technology Officer and co-founder of the Center for Open Science. I'm also the co-lead of SHARE and a visiting assistant professor at the University of Virginia's Department of Engineering and Society. This is, this is uh, what I've been calling my, my fun talk. Uh, I've been looking forward to this for a while uh, uh, because I think there's a lot we can learn um, about data integrity from these very neat but very stigmatized technologies like Bitcoin, BitTorrent, and Usenet. Um, so librarians and archivists care about data integrity, um, persistence, preservation, decentralization, distribution, robustness, fault tolerance, and inclusivity. And these are, these are actually the concerns of these technologies, these, these protocols, these services like Bitcoin, BitTorrent, Usenet. Although these services do have uh, this stigma um, because the, the qualities of pseudo-anonymity make them uh, prone to illegal use cases. But again, I, I think there's a lot that we can learn from, from these. So I want to start with a question. Uh, if someone removed the Oxford commas from a document, for example, the title of my talk, how would I know that? Uh, and so the, the most simple way is direct comparison. Uh, for every character in my title, I could go through uh, and say the D and D are the same, the A and A are the same, all the way to the comma, okay, it's missing. Um, someone thinks that librarians are archivists and criminals. Uh, that was not my intent. Uh, and so now I know that, that uh, this has been uh, subtly changed out from under me. But what if direct comparison is impossible or impractical? For example, if I send you a file, uh, you don't necessarily have direct access to my version anymore. You can't do this character-by-character this -character comparison, this byte-by-byte -byte comparison. Um, or let's say I want to track the integrity of a file over time. That original file may be corrupted. So how do I, what metadata do I need to store um, and or share with you that would represent this idea of sameness, that these are identical? So how, how about file size? Um, we can look at that. Uh, so the title of my talk um, uh, has 56 characters. It's 56 bytes of information. Um, and if we just took the, the, the length of that, if we look at the one with the Oxford comma uh, removed, uh, we see a difference. But this is very easy to get around. I can just add a, a space there and then I wouldn't know that this has changed. Um, so in this, this latter example, I, I, don't, I wouldn't necessarily know that anything has changed. If a bit flipped but the same number of bits were there, I wouldn't recognize the change. And this is where hash functions come in. Um, can I just get a quick show of hands of who, how many people know what a hash function is? Okay, uh, good. Uh, this will be a pretty high level overview um, and I'm happy to get uh, uh, deeper in the, the Q&A um, or later. Um, so hash functions, uh, a few definitions. Hash functions deterministically map input data to output that is generally smaller in size. So if I take, uh, and I hope you can see this well, if I take the MD5 hash function, uh, uh, I'm, I'm telling it it's a string. This is just on the command line on, on Max or Unix uh, platform, MD5-S, the string that I'm looking to hash. Um, I get uh, a, uh, a small output that is of smaller size than the title. MD5 is a 128-bit hash, so I get 32 characters information uh, in hexadecimal notation. Uh, so if that was using the full alphabet, I'd actually have a much smaller uh, hash uh, output. Um, and then if you were to run the same command, you would get exactly the same output. This is because it's deterministic. Okay, so hash functions map arbitrarily sized input data to output that is of fixed size. So if, if I uh, do that hash again, but if I compare that to a hash without the subtitle, um, I get two different responses. But they are the same size, they are of fixed size. Uh, so the smaller input did not change the size of the output. I could do this with a PDF, with a PowerPoint presentation. I could do this with uh, gigs of data, terabytes of data, and I would have the same 128-bit um, output, or 32 hexadecimal characters. And hash functions map input uniformly over an output range. 
they should appear random. They should be random. Uh, I ran 1.6 million uh, hashes against random strings. Uh, and because there are six characters uh, of, in the hash, uh, this is the hexadecimal uh, uh, output, um, so the first character of the hash, I just took that and, and, and plotted it, um, we see about 100,000 uh, uh, counts of those um, because it's, it's uniformly distributed. I could do the same thing for the second character, the third character, I could do the first two characters and map that out across the space and I would see the same uniform distribution. And then a special type of hash that I want to focus on is the cryptographic hash. Um, and these hashes are non-invertible and collision resistant. Uh, for a given input, the output is practically unique. Uh, so here, um, uh, I've taken the, the hash of the title, but I've just removed the S. But the two outputs are, are very different. It wasn't just one character that changed, even though I just changed one character in the title. Uh, uh, this is, this is um, uh, coming to this idea of non-invertible. Uh, and collision resistance. So non-invertible means that simply knowing the output tells me nothing of the input. You can't give me this, this new hash here and I would somehow be able to tell you this was the one missing an S. I know nothing of the content. Uh, and they're collision resistant in that it's hard to find two inputs that have the same identical output. And this is important. Uh, the birthday paradox tells us that with a 128-bit hash like MD5, uh, it would take two to the 64 hashes of, of random inputs to find a collision. Given any two, any two strings um, or files, the chance of collision is two to the negative 128th. This is practically unique. So back to my original question. If someone removed the Oxford commas from a document, uh, how would I know that? Uh, well, I could just take the MD5 hash of both versions uh, and compare them and see that the, the, the commas were removed. Uh, someone rejected clarity in communication and removed the comma. Uh, uh, that'll be the end of my Oxford comma jokes. Uh, I'm happy to talk about those in Q&A if you'd like. They are very important. Uh, 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 and you're the only audience I can actually tell that to and think you'll laugh or find it funny. Uh, so why does this matter? Uh, because data integrity is important. It's the concept we started with. Uh, media is prone to data degradation, data decay, data rot. Um, unintentional corruption, which is the most use cases that we'll, we'll be thinking about, is, is pretty rare. Hard drives are pretty reliable these days, but we're working with such large scales of data and accessing it so quickly and so often that even those low probability events are actually quite common. Two examples of that, and this just comes straight from Wikipedia on data corruption. Uh, NetApp found more than 400,000 silent data corruptions. Uh, 30,000 of those were not detected by their hardware raid that was supposed to detect these, these changes. That is a lot of unknown corruption. CERN found 128 megabytes of data permanently corrupted across 97 petabytes. So yes, that's a big amount of data, but 128 megabytes of permanent corruption is a lot of, of, of bad files. Um, that is a lot of bad data. Or data that we can no longer really can trust. Okay, so uh, this, is, this is again where these cryptographic hash functions come in. Um, there's a few, there's quite a few. Um, uh, MD5s are the ones I've been talking about. Those aren't recommended if security is an issue, if you're concerned about um, the chance of, of uh, intentional um, corruption, uh, someone falsifying data. Um, there's some vulnerabilities, and they're just very hashed. So brute force, brute force attempts are, are very easy because it's so easy to go through and try different combinations to get a, a, a certain hash. SHA-1 is in that same camp. There's, there's no uh, vulnerabilities necessarily, um, but it, it is a pretty fast hash. Uh, NIST is recommending that people use SHA-2s, SHA-256s, SHA-512s. These are more complex hashes. Um, they have uh, a greater number of bits. Uh, they result in, in longer outputs. Uh, they're, they're slower to calculate. Um, so there's, there's some benefits beyond just the identification of data. Um, because uh, there's this uniqueness uh, ideal, uh, we, can, we can save space. Um, this is called content addressable storage. We can change our storage from, uh, for example, Mary storing her data um, on a file system under her folder. Um, uh, John uh, also storing some data. Uh, they have the same file name, but they have different file sizes, different hashes. And then Chris maybe makes a copy of, of Mary's data. They store that in their folder. Um, if, we, if we have a, a, a content addressable uh, system, storage system on the back end of, the, of this, um, we only need to store that file once. 
We, we identify it by its uh, uh, hash, uh, in this case 23C1D, I'm just using a, a, a shortened version of a hash. Um, but then we, we've saved all the space, and then we can create interfaces on top of that to create these virtual file systems with folders and files if people need them. So the takeaways from this is that, that we can pair hashes with downloads. Um, if, if people are downloading data from us, from our services, from our, our websites or applications, uh, you can include hashes. Um, then teach them how to use those hashes with tools that, that are pretty common, uh, like MD5, MD5SUM, uh, the same for SHA-1, SHA-256, Python's hash lib library is, is very nice, very easy to use. Uh, and then we should be thinking about um, using content addressable storage just, for, just to, to save space. We're collecting a lot of data. We want people to, to reuse that data. We want people to reproduce it. Uh, we're going to see a lot of copies of that. And so a content addressable storage system is, is quite efficient. Okay, so now to the, to the fun stuff. So um, Usenet. Uh, how many people have heard of Usenet? How many people have used Usenet? Good. Uh, uh, established in 1980, one of the first um, uh, World Wide Web type networks. Uh, users can read and post messages on topics called news groups. Um, they're similar to uh, bulletin board systems of the time and, and modern internet forums. Uh, there was no central server or, or administration needed. Uh, the, the news group servers just talked to each other. Um, and then over time, people started using it to store and share files. But that was a bit problematic. Um, Usenet was not designed to transmit binary files. Uh, more than that, uh, there were message size limits. Uh, most clients were, were similar or, or the same as email clients, and so you had the same limitations with how, how big of a file that you could, you could uh, uh, post to Usenet. And this is where some of the uh, uh, unsavoriness sort of comes in, as, as, as people use, started using this, this as a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing service uh, uh, for sometimes uh, uh, illegal or copyrighted uh, uh, information. So how people got around these constraints, though, uh, being very clever, uh, uh, was they, they split the files up. And they would split them up into what were called RAR archives, um, that would result in many files. They would then encode those um, uh, from a binary encoding into something that was handled by, uh, by Usenet, um, some text-based encoding, like YENC. Um, but what would happen is you'd go to download these files, and sometimes there'd be hundreds of these split files, and one or two would be missing. Uh, or, or you'd find out that a file was corrupted. There's synchronization problems, things were taken down, uh, copyright notices would be posted, and so they pull partial uh, files from, from the, the systems. Um, and so what people did was uh, uh, used a, a common technique called parity computation. And I want to make sure that's differentiated, differentiated from parity computation. Uh, thank you for laughing. Uh, uh, and, and the best case of this that we might know is, is redundant arrays of independent disks, RAID. Uh, the idea being that you could lose some data, you could lose a drive, and you'd be able to recreate that. Um, and so one form of parity uh, uh, comes from the XOR operation. It's, it's pretty simple. You XOR a zero and a one, you get a one, one and zero, one. Everything else, you get a zero. And so how this works is that you, you might have three drives of data or data on three drives. Uh, you XOR the contents of those drives. So we're gonna go down that first column. One, one is a zero, zero and zero is a zero, so that's how I get the first bit. Uh, one, zero is a, is a one, one, zero is a one, uh, one, zero is a, a one, one, one is a zero. So that's how I get this information, and I put that on, on this um, parity drive. Um, so we did this calculation. I just stick this on this drive. Now if we lose this, one, of the, one of the source drives, what we can do is take that same XOR operation with the remaining data, and if we do this calculation, we get the identical data that was on that uh, lost drive. Um, this, is, this is very powerful. This is how RAID 5 works, for example. Um, data is striped across multiple drives, including one, and then parity information is stored on, on one of those drives. So, uh, the A files are stored on the first three drives with the parity on the fourth, the B, uh, the parity is on the, the third disk, and so forth. And so we use this, this type of uh, uh, paradigm when it comes to uh, uh, filling in these gaps. And so one of the, uh, uh, I'd, I'd say the, the, the most authoritative uh, implementations of this, R2 command line 
Um, we're going to create par archives. And so it's very simple. Uh, you run the, the command par2 create. We were going to say a redundancy level. Um, we set it with the, the dash r, uh, dash r uh, flag. Um, we'll say 10. This gives us a 10% redundancy, so you can have 10% fail. Um, we uh, tell it the name of the par2 file to generate, and we take that um, Ubuntu ISO uh, that we're going to uh, distribute. Um, and you get uh, a bunch of other files. So you get, not only do you have the split files, you get these par archive files. And the first of them is an index file of hashes. This is where the hashes come in to, to verify the integrity. Uh, so a very core role in this. And those other files have this parity information that can be used to regenerate uh, missing data. And so when we, when we have this, you just run two other commands. You do a verify, um, and then you do a repair. And that's it. You now recover uh, that lost um, uh, Ubuntu release. Uh, and the, the great thing is that you don't even need to have a complete volume set of those uh, parity archives. You can still recover data uh, with corruption and loss to the archive files. So this is, this is very neat. Um, so I think the takeaway here is that we should be using parity archives. Um, we can't trust systems like RAID to catch all of the corruption that exists uh, in our systems. And it doesn't cost us a lot to keep this uh, redundant information that can be distributed or, or used in the case of uh, uh, what would otherwise be permanent failure. Okay, next, BitTorrent. Um, uh, I'm not even gonna ask you to raise your hands about this. 2009, I think uh, uh, it was responsible for 20% of internet traffic. Now that it's sort of fighting with Netflix and YouTube, uh, that's down to 3.35% of internet traffic. That's still a lot of traffic that is, that is uh, going across uh, torrent networks. Uh, this is a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing protocol. Um, it was designed and released in 2001. And how it works is, is sort of similar. Uh, we, we split files up and, and we uh, share with each other the information that we have. And so I might have the, the first few uh, blocks of information and I share that with one person and they share with another person some of the information they have. So this really can maximize um, bandwidth, throughput. Um, this can maximize uh, um, the ability to contribute. Anyone can, can, uh, can take part in the, the sharing and, and uh, and storage of information. And so where it gets to the, the again, the, the core concept of hashes is that a torrent file is really just metadata and a list of hashes. When you, when you give me one of those pieces that you have that I don't have, I just look up the hash and, and see if they match. And if they do, I keep that information. If they don't, I, I get it from someone else. So this is a very uh, uh, efficient system. Another, another uh, role that hashes play in, in uh, uh, more modern torrent systems is the distributed hash table. Um, this is a, a data structure that's quite widely used, um, but it, it makes for the ability to uh, look up things in a decentralized and distributed way. So for, for torrents, for example, um, I can look up a torrent by its hash, by, by its identifier, basically, uh, uh, and ask a bunch of peers if they have that information and then get their IP addresses back um, uh, if they do. Uh, and so uh, we, we distribute this lookup process. And this adds a, a high degree of fault tolerance and, and a large degree of scalability. Not one server is responsible for, for serving out all of this information. Takeaways there, uh, we should use the torrent protocol for data storage. Um, we should use distributed hash tables to provide lookup for these content addressable storage systems and peer discovery networks. Okay, Bitcoin, uh, uh, cryptocurrency electronic payment system introduced in 2008. Um, it's based on a blockchain, which is a public distributed immutable ledger. It can also be thought of as a database, a key value database. Um, Bitcoins are mined by people that create and verify hashes. The hash plays a central role throughout uh, the Bitcoin um, protocol. As of today, one Bitcoin uh, was uh, over $1,100 US dollars. Uh, Bitcoin, again, it's a very benign technology. It's being used for some illegal practices because of the pseudo-anonymity. Um, uh, uh, we, we saw uh, it being used for the sale and purchasing of, of, of drugs and whatnot on Silk Road um, and some other uh, sometimes pretty scary services like assassination uh, markets. But you can look that up on your own. Uh, uh, but there's some really interesting stuff behind it. And so one of them is the, was the blockchain. 
the blockchain here uh, is a chain. Uh, and so block 12, uh, the header of block 12 contains the previous hash, the previous block's hash, a timestamp, um, another hash of the actual transactions, the who sold what to whom, uh, when they sold it, how much, uh, and then a nonce, uh, some randomness that you'll see in a moment. Uh, and so that previous hash of block 12 points to the hash of block 11's header, uh, which has block 10's hash built into it. And so we create this chain such that uh, if you change anything, um, the, the body of the transactions, the header information, the hashes, the whole uh, uh, chain falls apart and we know that it, it won't verify and then people won't distribute and use it. Um, the body of block 11 also includes those transactions um, by, uh, uh, by a hash. Uh, this is actually a neat data structure called a Merkle tree. I'm not gonna get into that. Um, but uh, uh, what, what the miners are doing, they're hashing these headers which contain all of this rich information to verify the data. And so mining is actually hashing. It's SHA-256 hashing. Mining requires proof of work. Um, this means that the, the work was difficult and that it's easily verifiable. And so if, uh, we don't want mining to be too easy uh, because there'd be too much Bitcoin and, and it would lose all its value. And so they've, they've set these difficulty rates. Um, because hashing has a known difficulty and it's easily verified, it, make, it makes for a good computation for this purpose. So the miner's task, their goal, is to generate a hash of tr that, that transaction metadata, those headers, by adding some random data at the end via the nonce and sometimes changing the timestamp just a little bit, such that the resulting hash starts with, for example, 18 zeros. We're trying to meet some difficulty level. So I can't just generate a hash with 18 zeros. I have to do a lot of work to try to find one. And so there's, there's um, uh, a lot of computers uh, built specifically for hashing. Um, that's the only really viable way to make money right now as a miner. Um, but what they basically do is take the SHA-256 of that metadata, of that header, and then add a one. And then they add a two, and a three. And they keep doing that until they found, for example, 18 leading zeros. Um, last night, uh, miners generate a hash like this. Um, you can see those zeros. They, they, out of all the things they tried, they found one that met this difficulty criteria. Uh, they rewarded with 12.5 Bitcoin. That was uh, more than $14,000 to find that hash. This is, this is the work they're doing uh, to, to add these transactions to the, to the blockchain. The challenge here is that the blockchain uh, grows uh, uh, and grows and grows and grows. Uh, and right now the, the, the Bitcoin blockchain is about 110 gigabytes. That's a pretty sizable um, uh, amount of information. It is immutable. Um, uh, there's a couple of attacks that can change history. I'm not going into details about those, but it is very hard to erase anything in particular from the blockchain. Almost, you, you, you should just consider it impossible. That the, it's intended to, to, to um, uh, be persistent in terms of what it, what it has inside of it. Uh, and because you can use these encoding tricks like they used in Usenet, uh, you can put pretty much anything on there. They would just be transactions that don't mean anything, but they could get written to the blockchain. And so, for example, there's some uh, uh, pretty, pretty bad stuff, uh, links to some illegal things uh, that exist in the blockchain, which creates some sort of ethical and legal uh, questions around who has that on their computers and what that means. Um, and those things will be there forever. So the takeaways here, I think, that is that blockchains are, are great for distributing immutable records. So we've been hearing about ideas, uh, for example, of turning data repositories into blockchains. Just store the data in a blockchain, um, store journals in blockchains. I think it's a little uh, quick to do that. There's still work being done in this area uh, in terms of revoking content from, from blockchains in an efficacious way. Um, uh, and so instead I would go back to hashes. Um, uh, if someone puts a, a journal article that accidentally include, um, uh, for example, personal health information, it would have to be taken down. We have to get that back. And these accidents happen all the time. Um, so this is, an un, this is an intentional stuff of people not wanting to share. This, these, are, these are accidents that we have to uh, be able to deal with. So rather than putting content in the blockchain, in, in order to also reduce the size of that chain, I, I, I just recommend storing hashes. Uh, store those, those, uh, those things that we can then follow up, with, perhaps with persistent identifiers or metadata, and, and, and find the content and then guarantee that it is the same content, content that's referenced. But if it had to be taken down, a notice could be could be put there uh, such that you could still have this um, ability to uh, uh, revoke or retract information. 
And then there's some really interesting stuff with regards to compensation. Um, uh, you can imagine a system where uh, journals perhaps extract fees via transactions, um, uh, where, where uh, uh, if they're doing copy editing or peer review and, and people want to pay for that, um, uh, that could just come right intrinsically from the blockchain. So this has been a sort of whirlwind tour of these technologies and of hashes. Um, I think it's, it's one of my favorite uh, uh, topics in, in uh, computer science and, and in the uh, uh, development world. Um, things I didn't cover, I've left out a lot of details. If you download my slides, you'll see a bunch of slides that I, I just didn't have time to get through. Um, I didn't talk about hashes as data structures, hashes and website security, which is a fun topic. I didn't talk about other forms of parity or issues with RAID 5, other types of RAID, um, file systems that are better to handle data integrity, um, uh, data corruption, uh, uh, vulnerabilities of these decentralized and distributed uh, systems. But all of this is, is interesting stuff, and once you really uh, grasp the core concepts, um, it, it, it uh, is a little more manageable to, to understand. Um, what have I stolen? Uh, since I'm being recorded, nothing, no copyrighted material, just ideas. Um, I, for example, in the Open Science Framework, one of the tools and services that we develop at the Center for Open Science, every version of a file um, comes with hash hashes. A uh, fast hash, MD5, and a slow hash, uh, SHA-256. Um, and so people can verify that the data um, uh, is the data that they think it is, or was intended to be. Um, we also use the content addressable storage system. I want people to fork each other's work. I want them to make copies of each other's work and reference it. I want them to register their content. That means making a copy and archiving it. Um, and I want them to do that uh, um, uh, because it's, it's what's good for scholarship, but I also want them to do that because it doesn't cost us anything. Uh, it's okay if they do that. If this wasn't a content addressable system, this would cost us a lot of money. Um, uh, we also store three types of hashes, uh, the MD5, SHA-1, and SHA-256, uh, to do different types of auditing uh, procedures. Um, we also store parity archives for every file that is on the system. So even if the storage systems that we use um, do have some of this uh, invisible corruption, uh, we should be able to recover that data. And then uh, with my, with my R&D team, COS Labs, we're exploring the use of the blockchain and torrent protocols for distributing and storing uh, metadata and data. Um, uh, data storage is a big problem in the space, and I think this, is, this could be one of the solutions. Uh, other groups are doing these things too. Um, uh, uh, these protocols can foster sustainability, like giving us new uh, ways to, to pay for these sorts of things, um, or distributing the, the costs burden, uh, and facilitating collaboration and, and inclusivity by increasing the number of individuals that can contribute. Um, I think these are very interesting citizen science projects. I think they're interesting ways for people to uh, uh, um, contribute in ways that they couldn't before. Uh, the Torrance Network is, I think, a, a good example of that. Uh, what can you steal? Um, uh, hashes, teaching people to check hashes, content addressable storage, parity archives, blockchains, uh, compensation via these transaction fees, the torrent protocol um, to increase inclusive contribution, um, and distributed hash tables for these uh, scalable lookups. That's all I have. You can find the presentation online, and I'm happy to answer questions or talk about this later. Thanks.